I started this company when I was a boy with a dream of making the world a better place. Welcome back Autobots, Decepticons, and everything in between to another episode of Fixing Transformers. In today's we're going to take a look at the history of KSI, better known as Kinetic Solutions Incorporated, and this will serve to be a part 1 video to how Galvatron became Megatron, along with setting up the seas for what happened in Mexico City, and it will also go into how KSI drones work. So without further ado, let's jump right in. So as a brief recap, Kinetic Solutions Incorporated was the company in Transformers Age of Extinction who made the man-made Transformers prototypes, which were ultimately taken over by Galvatron who turned them against the humans, and after Age of Extinction, KSI KSI was never mentioned of again, besides some of their prototypes showing up for a brief second in Transformers The Last Night. This leads to many questions being asked. For example, what happened to the company after Age of Extinction, how did Megatron become Galvatron, and what became of its founder, Joshua Joyce? So to answer all these questions, let's start from the beginning of KSI's lifespan. According to the film, Joshua Joyce started his company as a boy, with the dream to make the world a better place. We don't know what year KSI was exactly founded in movie continuity, but this can be easily sorted out. The actor for Joshua is played by Stanley Tucci. Tucci was born in 1960, and since Joyce tells us that KSI was founded by him when he was a boy, this means that his company would be founded no later than when he was 17 years of age, since after 17 you're an adult, which makes the founding of KSI roughly at 1977. Now up until the events of Age of Extinction, Joshua Joyce became a billionaire thanks to the KSI company according to Harold Antinger, and that's because KSI is a defense aerospace company which specializes in creating aircrafts, along with manufacturing weapon systems for the United States government. And this is backed up when Kate Yeager says, Defense, aerospace, government contracts, and they designed this drone. And those government contracts will come into play later. Now eventually in movie continuity, 2012 rolls around, and that's where the events of Transformers Dark of the Moon take place. After the Battle of Chicago, many lives are lost due to the Autobots war with the Decepticons. Tensions between humans and Cybertronians had risen dramatically after the battle. And although the Autobots are officially granted asylum on Earth, the public's opinion on Transformers has turned against them. Because of this, the government of the United States terminated all human Autobot joint programs, which ultimately got Ness shut down. But to still combat the remaining Decepticons, forces on Earth, the government put in place Cemetery Wind, an elite black ops CIA unit, finishing what Ness started, with the new organization being intended to flush out the handful of Decepticons left on Earth, with its founder being longtime CIA agent Harold Antinger. And Antinger will become very important in a bit. The government still worried about possible future Transformers attacks, gave Kinetic Solutions Incorporated a special government contract to collect remains of the dead Transformers and reverse engineer their technology to be turned into weapons for the United States. This would lead KSI to conduct a huge cleanup effort, cleaning up all the Transformer scraps they could. Now something to note, for a long time on Earth there's been a rare Earth metal that had interested KSI, but they couldn't figure out what its purpose was. During the events of Age of Extinction, more of this mysterious metal will be found by Joyce's ex-girlfriend, Darcy Tyrrell, an archaeologist who worked for KSI. She would be in the Arctic when she would find these dinosaurs cyberformed into this metal. This would lead her to come up with the conclusion that instead of the meteorite that wiped out the dinosaurs, it would have been this mysterious metal. This metal caused the great extinction. How and why, I can't yet say, but carbon dating puts it at 65 million years BC. Now KSI would find out the metal's purpose once they started melting down the bodies of dead Transformers, creating the connection that this rare earth metal originated from them, dubbing the metal Transformium. A rare earth metal. And then the aliens came, and we made the connection. Transformium. That's what we're calling it. Focus grouped, catchy, trademarked. Now what KSI would do once they have a dead Transformer would be to sever its head so they could download its mind for further study. And when they were done with the head, they would go to the melting plant to be turned into Transformium, which would be used to create their own Transformers, which they would call prototypes. Now KSI may have struck gold by downloading mines and having a bunch of Transformium thanks to the Chicago War, but they were struggling to actually fulfill their goal on creating a successful prototype and more or less programming Transformium. They would try and try to make it work, blowing tons of Transformium in the process. Now though the point how they blow Transformium was never stated in the film, it can be inferred since in the scene when Joyce is talking to Antinger, we hear his concern in needing more Transformium. I need more Transformium, and I need it now, to build more prototypes. So with this in mind, we can conclude that KSI has little Transformium left. Now you may be saying trance. How could they run out of Transformium if their ship's still around when Age of Extinction takes place, along with the Driller being a massive monster which could supply KSI with the Transformium they need for centuries? Well, if you think about it, Transformium comes from Transformers, not ships. I believe that the ships are made up of a different type of metal that is non-programmable. And for the Driller, well, if you think about it, he's not a Transformer. He never had a robot mode, and plus, it's speculated that the Driller is a creature that Shockwave created, hence why it wouldn't produce Transformium, since if it did, KSI would have not needed to worry about its 
Transformium supply. And a Transformium crisis can be further backed up when Darcy was talking about Transformium with Kate Yeager. I'm out there digging for it. There's just not much left to find. So that's how badly you boys need more, huh? Reduced to melting evil old Decepticons down. Joshua face of a Transformium crisis on his hands would need to figure out something fast if he want to achieve his goal on creating man-made Transformers. And luckily for him when he came in contact with Harold Antinger, Antinger was happy to oblige. You see, over the years, Antinger came to the conclusion that humanity would be safer off if all Transformers were gone from Earth. Aren't they our friends? Why? Because our world will never truly be safe till all of them are gone. And since Antinger was highly respected within the government, serving the CIA since 1992, officials wouldn't be keeping a close eye on him, letting him to be able to run certain aspects of a cemetery wind unit unannounced to the rest of the government. And knowing this power, Antinger went on his quest to eradicate all Transformers from Earth. He would eventually come in contact with the Cybertronian bounty hunter Lockdown, and Lockdown wanted to hunt down Optimus Prime and bring Prime back to his creators. Lockdown agreed to help hunt down the remaining Transformers on Earth, hoping to get some information out of them on the whereabouts of Optimus Prime. Now with this in Antinger's pocket, he sparked a three-way deal between Lockdown and Joyce, and I'm quoting from TF Wiki here, Antinger would assist Lockdown with a safe apprehension of Optimus Prime, and in return for Prime, Lockdown would give Antinger the seed. The seed would be given to Joyce, who would give Antinger 5 million shares in the soon-to-be thriving KSI, allowing Antinger to retire early. This complex deal would rid the world of Prime and the Transformers Antinger so despised, and provide the United States military with an army of man-made Transformers. Lockdown also assists Antinger in hunting down other Transformers on Earth, whose remains would be given to Joyce to further production or man-made Transformers, and lure Optimus out of hiding. Now you may be thinking that Antinger's doing this out of the goodness of his heart, to protect the world that he sees so valuable. Well, that's not the full story, you see. A large part of his crusade against Transformers is to secure enough money for a healthy retirement. And his greed is not just for money, but for fame. Harold Antinger desires recognition for the things he's done. And getting the world rid of Transformers would be his golden parachute to recognition. I have served my country for decades of unparalleled prosperity, and you are my golden parachute. So you are damn well jumping out of the plane with me. You see, it takes patience to make a man. The patience to watch and wait to protect all of us quietly for God and country without any recognition at all. Now if this deal in place, Joshua Joyce would not need to worry about Transformium anymore, since Antinger would handle that part with the help of Lockdown, along with the Seed, which once detonated would produce enough Transformium to last Joyce a decade. But Joyce would soon realize, if KSI would ever want to program Transformium and make it work, they would need an insider who knew the technology, an actual Transformer, if they ever want to fully understand and make the technology work. And this would be achieved once they recovered the Autobot brains from the wreckage of one of the Decepticon motherships. And to learn more about brains, check out my What Happened to Brains video. But once they got brains, brains was basically put into slavery, serving KSI. And as Brains puts it, No union, no benefits, no nothing. They put him in a glass box, where he was forced to help KSI engineer the prototypes. And if he would complain or speak out, he would get tortured by getting zapped, along with getting waterboarded. <laughs> And worst of all, getting his leg torn off. And though this one is never stated, but if you think about it, if you watch my Brains video, Brain scanned Wheelie to get his tires that he has on him now. Meaning that he got that updated robot mode once he was awakened out of stasis. And the only way to get his leg severed would have to be through the torture from KSI. Now KSI would give Brain severed Decepticon heads that he would have to do a mental autopsy on, to collect any data that still remained on them. But Brains would find out a chilling discovery once he started his autopsy on Megatron. Megatron's mind was actually still alive. And over the years at KSI, Megatron would come aware of KSI's alliance with the Cybertronian bounty hunter Lockdown and the CIA Task Force Cemetery Wind. Megatron would come up with a plan to manipulate KSI in going after the Cyberforming Seed, which once KSI got, Megatron would steal it, and the Seed would allow him to create enough Transformium to build a massive Decepticon army to replace all the fallen soldiers who died in the Battle of Chicago. He's been playing KSI all this time, all so that he can manipulate them into going after the Seed. He wants to detonate that seed in the biggest city and kill millions. He'll have enough to build a massive army and annihilate your species forever. Now, if KSI had not what Megatron had learned about what they were doing, they should have used ExpressVPN. Now, ExpressVPN is a virtual private network that makes your internet browsing completely anonymous from anyone besides yourself. This means from hackers, your internet service provider, your parents, and most importantly of all, Decepticons. Especially Soundwave, who's probably attached to a satellite again, trying to steal your data and sell it off to Dylan Gold. And yeah, nobody wants their data sold to Dylan. Now, ExpressVPN has many servers around the globe that you can connect to, making your IP address impossible to track, along with making Soundwave very mad. Now, I 
personally use ExpressVPN to make sure that nobody steals my data. And in this day and age when data is more valuable than oil, it's important to make sure that companies don't steal it. And did you know that your internet service provider can see all the websites that you've been to, regardless of incognito? And the sad thing is that in America they can legally sell your data for a profit. So if you don't want this to happen to you, ExpressVPN has your back. Once Joshua learned that Megatron hacked into his company and stole his data, he was a very mad man. But once he installed ExpressVPN, he was happy as a clam. So if you don't want your data stolen by Decepticons and in the hands of Dylan Gold, check out ExpressVPN today. By using my link, expressvpn.com slash trans theories, you'll get three months for free. Now that's a heck of a deal. And I want to say thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this video. Now back onto the story, Brains would eventually find out about Megatron's plan, but would not decide to tell Joyce about it due to him being tortured by him. You knew this and you didn't warn them? Little girl, you can go to a pretty dark place when you're on death row. You dumb greedy bastard just bought extinction to yourself. Not my problem though. Now if Megatron's plan set in motion, if he ever wanted a new body, he would need to teach KSI how to use Transformium, the code that Joshua Joyce was trying so hard to crack. So Megatron fed KSI science, specs, and history about Cybertronians. This little gentleman has been translating for us all the information that comes from these two heads. Their history, their science, everything. And with this new information, Joyce was now able to start creating his own man-made Transformers. This would let Joyce to own the entire Transformers genome. Joyce would then start playing around with Transformium, learning how to control it and give it instructions. Instead of using the traditional transformation of a regular Transformer, Joyce would want something more economic as his transformation. That's why we see the Transformium transform into little blocks when transforming between two objects. This can be backed up since Joshua was also planning to bring KSI to the civilian market. It would be easier and more visually appealing if he programmed this new transformation, which would be unique to the KSI brand. And since we see how easy it is to switch between two modes, it would be more appealing to the civilian markets. Since if you would have a regular transformation, with all those parts moving around, someone could get hurt, easily getting their hair or fingers stuck while the object is transforming. So this new transformation KSI uses serves to fix that issue. And so instead of trying to recreate how Transformers actually transform, Joyce just carried over his custom version of transforming to his military prototypes. KSI would make several military prototypes. The Traxes or Sentries, which served to be the ground soldiers. The KSI Boss, which would be used to manage the Sentries and the other prototypes. The Junk Heaps, which were an innovation that showed that more than one prototype could be put into one vehicle. Or Yobot, who served to be the robotic guard to protect the KSI facility though he did not do a good job, and two heads, which I'll get to in a bit. But the crown jewel for KSI was Galvatron and Stinger. Let's start off with Stinger. Now Stinger from the ground up was an inspiration from Bumblebee, but was built to be better in every way. But if you think about it, how did KSI get Bumblebee's schematics to build Stinger? If you look at Stinger's feet, they're identical in design to Bumblebee's, so how could this be possible? Well, remember how I said that KSI was given a special government contract? Well, I'm positive that they were given all the files from Nest and Sector 7. This is how I can back this up. In this scene, we can clearly see the schematics for 07 megs. And you know who else would have those schematics? Sector 7. And after they were shot down, they were most likely given a Nest for further study. And speaking of Nest, they would have all the schematics for the Autobots, along with many Decepticons, up until they were shot down around 2013. And this can be proven because we can see a schematic of Brawl on this monitor, though it's very hard to see. Along with them having a replica of Bumblebee's lower torso, which they could only build with Bumblebee's schematics. And these files would have to be logically in Nest's possession before their closure. Now KSI also got files from Cemetery Wind, and this is proven because we can see Evasion Mode Optimus Prime right here. And the interesting thing is, that He's in his classic red and blue, which means that he must have taken this form during the events of Mexico City. So I think that Secretary Wind must have gotten these schematics from scanning Prime during the Mexico City battle. And since it was a battle, it would explain why the schematics show Prime to be a bit damaged. And this all can be backed up when Lockdown says, So what happened in Mexico City? Well, you had it. Three direct hits, a mortal wound, then your men allowed him to escape. What happened to you? An ambush, a trap. Set by humans. So this proves that Prime was last seen in his robot mode, in his classic red and blue. So keep this in mind for the Mexico City video. And if out of the way, we can conclude the reason why Stinger looks so similar to Bumblebee in certain aspects is because they worked with Bumblebee's schematics to create Stinger. But when we move on to Galvatron, he's a whole different story. You see, up until the events of Age of Extinction, Galvatron went through five different iterations, with the one that we see in AoE being the most recent one, with the hole in the chest being a new addition. This is the fifth iteration. Why does it keep turning out like this? Now you may be wondering when they made Stinger, he came out perfectly, along with all the other KSI drones. But once Galvatron comes around, it's a different story. So why is that? Well if you remember, Mechatron was still alive, and so he was able to give the knowledge of Cybertronian history to KSI, through brains decrypting the data. And since if he could do this, I believe he could somehow create a virus, letting him have a backdoor within KSI, giving him access to everything they were doing. Now this can be backed up since if you remember, brains knew exactly what Megatron was trying to do, and because of the torture he received, he decided to let Megatron do his thing to get back at KSI. 
die. Now if Megatron had a system, he could manipulate anything at his will. But for the most part, he wouldn't tamper with anything, besides giving knowledge of the seed to Joyce. Since Megatron knew that Cemetery Wind would only hunt down so many Transformers, and that Transformium would eventually run out. And if you remember after the events of the Chicago Battle, the Decepticon faction was in shambles. With all its key players dead and an army destroyed, Megatron needed to do something more than to just get a new body. He needed a new army. So by giving KSI knowledge of the seed, it would let Megatron rebuild the army that he so desperately needed. And with KSI creating man-made Transformers, he would be able to be given a new body, way stronger than his previous ones, and in similar specs to his original form from 2007. Along with Cemetery Win and Lockdown taking care of Prime, nothing would stand in the way in Megatron's conquest. And I may be wondering how Megatron knew about the seed. And well, he's not the only Transformer who knows about it, since his arch enemy Optimus Prime also knew about it, along with the Autobot Hound. And they took something that they called the seed. Listen. 60 million years ago, give or take an eon, thousands of planets were cyberformed with seeds. So if Prime and Howe knew about it, it's likely known by all Transformers. And it was by chance that Lockdown was able to supply one to the humans, since without it, Megatron's plan would have fallen through. So to circle back on the question on why Galvatron turned out different, it was because Megatron was able to hack into the rendering sequence of Galvatron when he was getting made, creating the Galvatron body into his own image. I modeled Galvatron after Optimus Prime. Why does he keep looking like Megatron? Also, they could build him a brand new body. Then he infected it with his evil, nasty chromosomes. Now you may be wondering how Megatron's chromosomes factor in all of this, along with the Insecticons in his head. So let's start off with the chromosomes. Now chromosomes are something that you guys should have learned in your science classes, but to refresh your memory, chromosomes are the things that make organisms what they are. They carry all the information used to help a cell grow, thrive, and reproduce. They are also made up of DNA. So with that in mind, Megatron infected the Galvatron prototype with his DNA, causing it to look like him. Now we know that KSI designed Galvatron after Optimus Prime, not Megatron. And as we see, thanks to Megatron's DNA infecting the prototype, it led to it looking like Megatron. But the reason why it doesn't look exactly like Megatron is because KSI also has a tug of war with the design, which makes a hybrid of what Megatron wants and what KSI is intending the design to be. Hence why the Galvatron prototype looks like something KSI would produce, while at the same time it looks like Megatron. Now how about those Insecticons? How do they play into all this? And well, I believe they are used to transfer Megatron's mind into the Galvatron body. Since in this shot, we see them going back and forth between the Galvatron truck and Megatron's head. I would also infer that they would fly over to the Galvatron body to infect it also. So in conclusion, they must be somehow transferring Megatron's mind into the Galvatron body. And fun fact, these Insecticons have the exact same CGI model as the one that we saw from Transformers Revenge of the Fallen. But now moving back onto the topic at hand, you may be wondering, if Megatron already had his mind downloaded to the KSI database, then why would he have to go to extra mile with these Insecticons? Well, I believe why he did this was because he wanted to make sure that his whole mind would get transferred into the new body, since KSI could tamper with his mind on their databases. And once he would eventually download his mind into the Galvatron body, it is very likely that during that process, some parts may have not downloaded correctly or been corrupted when put into Galvatron's mind, since KSI already put some of their programming into Galvatron's mind to keep it from becoming sentient. So these Insecticons serve to be the safety net if anything would go wrong. So more or less view them as a backup drive for Megatron's mind. But now I want to move on to a new point that being the KSI programming. And I briefly touched upon this in my Nitro Zeus video. KSI drones were made to be non-sentient beings controlled by humans. So KSI had no intention to make them sentient. So in the fear that they would get self-control, they put some programming in place to stop them from becoming sentient. This is proven when they start controlling Stinger. When Stinger was ordered to do something, he did. He never abuses weapon systems on like Galvatron, who was slowly getting controlled by Megatron by speaking to Optimus Prime, along with abusing his weapon systems. Misfire, 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 misfire. System failure, Galvatron just fired four rockets. And he spoke. How did that happen? This is further the case when Megatron gets full control of the Galvatron prototype. The first thing that comes out of his mouth is I am Galvatron. I am Galvatron! And since we know that Megatron is disgusted by human technology, under no circumstance would he say this willingly. And thus he eventually trashes the Galvatron body and goes back to being Megatron which I'll be explaining in a future video. But to put the nail in the coffin for this sub-theory, take a look at this line of dialogue. We are programming this, right? Yes. Mostly. So with that statement in mind, I'm positive that all the things I've said about programming is true, but how does this work for the other KSI bots? Well, if you remember in the film, Megatron reactivated all the other KSI drones and put them under his command. Now, the way he did this was never explained, but there was one line of dialogue in the film that hinted how he did it. Galvatron's hacked into the others. What? Now this line is spoken by Sue Yeming, the CEO of KSI China. She's worked on the prototypes as much as Joyce, so she knows the ins and outs and how they work. So with this in mind, we know that Galvatron has hacked into them. Now the way I personally believe he did this was by going into the KSI servers sometime before he awakened, 
and start to get rid of the KSI programming for all the drones that were combat ready. Now the reason I said only the combat ready drones was because we saw many other cars on the side that did not get converted into KSI drones. And those were the cars that were taken in for scanning earlier in the film. Since KSI takes in cars of either potential vehicle modes for their prototypes, a process which is called scanning, which we saw when a truck pulled the new cars in for KSI. We saw a white Ferrari 458 Italia and a 2002 Cadillac Sienna and both would reappear when Galvatron takes control of the KSI prototypes. Now the reason why those two vehicles did not get activated into drones was because they didn't have a robot mode equivalent attached to them. Let me explain. The way a KSI drone is created is to first get a vehicle for it. This is called scanning according to K. Yeager. A couple times a day these guys are moving in vehicle shipments into KSI for something called scanning. What's with this vintage crap? We're not scanning collector car junk. Now though it's never stated if this is the first step, I believe it is, since the robot modes are based off of the vehicle modes that each KSI bot is linked to, besides Boss and Two Heads, but I'll get to them in a bit. The next step after the vehicle is scanned in, is to create a design for what you want your KSI bot to look like, and once KSI would find a design they would like, they would then take it to the rendering sequence, where their design is fully built of Transformium, that comes out of the tanks at the back of the station, and this put over onto the exoskeleton of the KSI drone, where it creates all the internal and external parts of the drone. And if the KSI bot fulfills KSI's vision, I assume it gets lowered down to the trap door that we see under Galvatron to be transported to the next phase, which is linkage. Now linkage is a concept that I've come up with to explain how a KSI bot gets its vehicle mode. Now as we know, KSI bots are made up of Transformium, which is programmable metal. So with the schematic file of the vehicle, they connect that to the robot mode design, creating a linkage between the robot and vehicle mode. So once the KSI bot would transform, it would shapeshift into the vehicle it was linked to. Now linkage is also used for the weapon systems in robot mode for the drones. As you can see when a KSI bot transforms, it fades into existence, while well, the same fading is seen when a weapon is deployed. The reason why it's not used for vehicles is because the vehicle mode weapon systems are more or less built into the vehicle itself, not needing weapon linkage, proven by the fact that it transforms out of the car instead of fading into existence. Now the last and final step in creating a KSI drone is to fill it up with Energon. Now as we saw with all the KSI drones, they leak out green Energon. Now the reason why it's green Energon, and not like the multiple different colors from the original three films, was because after Dark of the Moon, they decided to keep Energon a consistent green in the Bay films. So with that in mind, we can conclude that the way they got the Energon for their drones was most likely through draining the dead Transformers and repurposing their Energon for their drones, concluding why all KSI drones have green energy on. So for all that, that's my theory on how KSI created their drones. But now the next question is how do they activate them? Well I kind of went over this in my mini Dinobots theory, but as I said in that video, Energon and Electricity can be used to activate a Transformer, along with creating one. For example, the AllSpark Shard, which was introduced to us in Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, was said by Scapple to be able to produce Energon. And when the Shard was slammed into Megatron's chest, it created an electric shockwave that the Constructicons had to shield their eyes from, since it was so bright. Another Shard was able to replenish Jetfire's Energon, and gave him an electric electric shock that reawakened him out of stasis, but to hit the nail on the head, Megatron used some type of electricity wave when grabbing onto this pole, which goes to all the KSI prototypes, awakening them. So with that in mind, KSI probably learned about the Energon and Electricity combo through the science that Megatron told them about. And once the time came, Megatron would use this to his advantage and take control of the KSI prototype army to go after the seed. Now next point I want to circle back to is Two Heads and KSI boss. Now these two out of the KSI crew are the most out of place, since they don't have a vehicle mode on file, and Two Heads doesn't even seem like a Transformer KSI would even want to create, since if you compare him to everyone else, he's clearly the odd one out. So let's start off with Boss. Now the reason I think Boss doesn't have a vehicle mode is because KSI was attempting a new approach to how they create KSI prototypes. Instead of scanning the vehicle first and building their robot mode off of that, they would create a robot mode first and then find a vehicle that would fit it. Or if you think about it, they could assign Boss any vehicle they would want if both modes had the same relative amount of Transformium, since they made a plush rainbow dash turn into an assault rifle, along with the pill turning into a handgun. So with that in mind, the robot mode does not really have to match up with what the vehicle mode looks like. Take Galvatron for example. The only Freightliner Argazine truck parts that he has is the lights under the hole in his chest. And when Galvatron transforms, he becomes a Freightliner Argazine, with tires, a windscreen, and everything that is present without those parts being in his robot mode. This can also be seen with the KSI Traxxas, since if you look, they only have their front tires, while the back tires on bot mode are nowhere to be seen. This can also be said of Stinger, since he has a Pagani Hydra lights on his shoulders, along with his front tires being on his shoulders too, and not to mention the back tires being inside of his foot. And if you have a really keen eye, his crotch has Hydra on it. And besides those parts on him, it would be very hard to tell what vehicle he would go into. And I feel like once KSI started out their first run of prototypes, being the Traxxas and the Junk Heaps, they wanted them to resemble what they would turn into, but once they learned that they can transform any object into anything, they more or less strayed away from that authentic approach, but still gave parts onto the robot modes to resemble what they would transform into, but not to the extent as they did previously. 
As I said with Stinger, they did a close resemblance with the lights and tires, and I guess you could say with the color scheme as well, with the white stripe and vehicle mode carrying over to the robot mode. But if you could compare them to the Traxxas, the Traxxas are way more easier to identify what they transform into instead of Stinger. And fun fact, when Bonebee takes Stinger's design, you can see that he has lights on his chest, to resemble his vehicle mode counterpart. But remember how Stinger has lights on his shoulders? Well, ILM decided to also put Bumblebee's front lights on his shoulders, giving Bumblebee two sets of front headlights. And if you look at Age of Extinction Bumblebee's transformations, they're just a huge mess compared to his relatively clean ones that he had from the original trilogy. And that's mainly because Stinger's design was never meant to have a mechanical transformation. Hence why we see parts flying all over the place in the slow-mo shot, compared to the Dark of the Moon freeway chase scene, and that transformation looks way cleaner than the one that we saw from Age of Extinction. Concluding the fact that Stinger's design does not have enough vehicle parts to even be converted to a mechanical transformation, proving the point that KSI moved on from a bot mode that resembled the vehicle, to a bot mode that was more or less his own thing, straying away from the resemblance of the vehicle. So with this in mind, I want to circle back to KSI Boss. And with the reasons I set out, it shows why KSI most likely did Boss's robot mode first, since they weren't planning to give him any vehicle mode parts. And though we never saw what vehicle Boss was, we know for a fact that he has one, since Galvatron put all the KSI Boss units under his control. And to do that, the bosses must transform out of their vehicle forms. Now I personally believe that KSI Boss is a military UAV, and here's why. KSI is a defense aerospace company, meaning it to have knowledge in manufacturing aircraft. And since all the KSI prototypes are land-based, why not use the knowledge in aerospace and combine it with the transforming technology? And this can be proven from this scene in Age of Extinction. In aerospace, the military, we will own the entire robotics industry. All exploration. The oceans, space, everything. And to further back this up, if you look at Boss's design, it has two thrusters at the back of it, and an ordinary land vehicle would definitely not have that. And if we take a look at Boss's toy adaptation, it's a jet. And that's because it was a repaint of the Nitro Zeus mold from the last night. And since their CGI models are so similar, they just repainted the Nitro mold to look like Boss. So in conclusion, the toy adaptation would not be his actual vehicle mode. But what I think KSI Boss's actual vehicle mode is, like I said before, is a military drone. Since if you think about it, KSI Boss has no cockpit, and his overall design doesn't look like a manned vehicle. And a lot of military drones are electric or battery powered, and KSI Boss has these electric whips and concept art, which would match up with the vehicle being electric based. So with all that on the table, I conclude that KSI Boss's vehicle is some type of custom military UAV manufactured by KSI. But the last question for Boss I would like to bring up is, when Galvatron awoke into KSI Bots, why do we only see one in the factory? Well, in the Hong Kong battle, we saw many of them. And while that is because Galvatron's electric shock went through the whole KSI facility, not just that one building. As you can see, there's explosions from both buildings indicating that the KSI drones were awakened from inside the adjacent building. And there's a likely chance other KSI bosses were stored there, hence why we see more bosses in the final battle. And to push the energy effect even further, in the shot we see two different sets of junk heaps. But when Galvatron does his electricity thing, we don't see the junk heaps appear in the shot, but we know for a fact they join up in the final battle. So with that in mind, I hope it shows that every combat ready KSI drone was activated within KSI. KSI's manufacturing plant, leading for all of them to show up in the final battle. But now let's move on to the most confusing KSI bot, Two Heads. Now Two Heads is an interesting case, since he seems to be like something KSI would never create. And like I said before, if you compare him to everyone else, he's clearly the odd one out. And honestly, he doesn't feel like a KSI bot, but what if I told you that I may have found out the answer on why he looks so out of place? Currently, the theory that I have is that he was an experiment to understand Transformers anatomy. If you think about it, many Decepticons were brutally murdered during the Battle of Chicago, but Shockwave's body stayed relatively intact, besides him losing a kidney along getting his face finagled by Prime. And if you look at the two heads design, all the parts that got damaged on Shockwave were rebuilt, with the parts that were not damaged being the arms and the legs being copied over to the two heads design. And since the fusion cannon functionality was destroyed, they just gave him a copy of his left arm to be a replacement for his right. And of them knowing how to rebuild the body, they would then see if they could do their own modifications to it. For example, the two heads. And thus two heads came to be. But now you may be wondering, why would they make multiple versions of him if he doesn't look like a KSI bot? Well granted, there were only three head units ever made, with one being killed on screen. So I don't believe that he was ever planned to be sold in the mass markets since there's only three units of them ever made. But the reason why I think he was duplicated was a test that they could copy and paste their KSI bots easily, since if you think about it, they would eventually have to make hundreds of KSI bots, given enough time, with most of them being duplicates of the Tracks unit. So with that in mind, they would have to figure out an easy way to produce more, and that's where the rendering sequence comes into play. Now next question on Two Heads would be, what would he transform into? And well, since Two Heads was never intended to be used and more or less be sold, they probably gave the Two Heads units a vehicle mode that would complement their size, since their transforming would have to be relatively the same amount between robot and vehicle. And well, since KSI is a defense aerospace company, they could easily link him to a military vehicle, most likely a tank or a heavy 
heavy duty truck. And for him to be locked away in vehicle mode, it would make it easier to store him into facilities. Now with that out of the way, you may be thinking that we covered all the KSI drones, but what if I told you that we still have four more to go? And these four were only seen in their vehicle modes very briefly in the film. And since they do go into battle with Galvatron, it means they were combat ready drones and under Galvatron's control. So without further ado, let me show them to you. The first one is this white 2008 Aston Martin DBS, which we see follow Stinger into battle in this shot, along with Galvatron in this scene. And he's not to be mistaken for the many Aston Martin vanquishes that can be seen in the KSI factory, since those had a black painted roof. The next obscure bot would be this orange 2011 McLaren MP4-12C that we see following Stinger into battle behind the DBS, along with Galvatron on the bridge. And like the DBS, was only shown to be in these two scenes, and then never seen again. And to complete the squad, the last two were the green and blue 2011 Lamborghini Gerardo LP570-4 Super Lagara with the green one making a better appearance behind Galvatron, which we're only seeing driving on the bridge. Now these four KSI bots have no bios whatsoever, besides TF Wiki notifying the existence of the Aston Martin and the McLaren, but giving no insight on their character or personalities, and whether or not they died in the film. And since nobody else is gonna do it, I decided to make some bios for these guys, so they can hopefully be recognized in the future. Let's start off with the Lambos. Since like the Traxxas, they both have the same vehicle, but in different colors, this would most likely mean that the robot modes would be identical. So for these two, I'll call them the KSI Enforcers. They would be more powerful powerful than the KSI Traxxas, being overall faster and having superior firepower. More or less view these guys as the Black Ops unit for KSI. These units do the more sophisticated jobs that the rest of the bunch can't do. They more or less get their hands dirty so the world stays clean. Now let's move over to the Aston Martin DBS. Now since there's not multiple units of this character, this would mean like Stinger and Galvatron, it would be its own thing. So for this character, I would give it the name Knockout. Now I know the images of a Lambo and not a DBS, but what I'm trying to convey is the overall design, with this character being unique for having arm blades, similar to Dino from Dark of the Moon. Now the reason I gave him the name Knockout was because, if you remember in Transformers Prime, their incarnation of Knockout's vehicle mode was inspired by an Aston Martin. And Knockout was one of my favorite Prime characters in the show, so this way kind of brings him to the Bavers. And for what role he would serve for KSI, he would be created to see if they can make a prototype that could excel exclusively in hand-to-hand -in -hand combat. This would make the Knockout prototype agile and fast, and perfect for most combat situations. And last but not least, the McLaren. Now like Knockout, since there's no multiple versions, this would mean that this prototype would be its own thing. So for this character, I would give it the name Widowman. Now the reason I chose the name Widowmaker is not because my friend Alvitos is a pro Widowmane, but actually because Widowmaker was a scrapped concept for Transformers Age of Extinction. Now the Widowmaker concept art was an early version of Stinger that would eventually get scrapped, most likely because the design was too humanoid and not really fitting with the KSI aesthetic. So for the McLaren, I decided to bring that scrapped concept back. And as you can see, the design has a Bagani Hydra lights on it, but imagine them to be McLaren headlights instead. But the purpose she would serve for KSI would be as an infiltrator. Like Knockout, she'd be agile and fast. But with the added bonus of being able to adapt to any situation and to be able to learn all fighting styles got thrown her way, ultimately creating the perfect infiltrator and assassin in the long run. So yeah, I hope you guys like these bios of these four very obscure characters. Even more obscure than Revenge of the Fallen's Buckethead. And I love that Buckethead finally got the attention and the fandom that he needed, with people creating their own Buckethead figures, and actually calling him Buckethead, the name that I coined for that character back in the day. So I eventually hope these guys get accepted into the fandom like Buckethead did, and I hope that their origins and designs expand upon the vague template that I gave for them. Now the last question on his guys would be, what happened to them? And well, since we never saw them in the film during any battle, we can't really say if they survived or not, but I personally like to believe that they made it out alive. Maybe Galvatron knowing those four were the best of the best, sent them to go after the rest of the Autobots, who were in the night ship. But but since it was such a heavily forested area, they never came close, and eventually once they got back to the city of Hong Kong, the battle was done, leaving them to retreat and regroup with Megatron. But we're not done yet, since we still have to cover what happened to the KSI company, along with its founder Joshua Joyce, and the rest of the KSI drones who survived. So let's start off with what happened to KSI. And if you think about it, it's kinda obvious. If you look at it in a real world perspective, we know that transforming was the greatest achievement since the splitting of the atom, according to Gil Wembley. This is the greatest advance in modern physics since the splitting of the atom. Now if you think about it, even though the KSI boss made a huge mess in Hong Kong, the potential for this technology would definitely still be in demand, especially for the United States military. I don't think that Joyce would continue to make prototypes, since in the film he realizes that they were too dangerous to create. Maybe if he learned that Megatron hacked into the system, and was the cause for all of them to come evil, then Joyce probably would go back to making prototypes, but with extreme caution. But to move on to the question of what happened to the KSI company after, I'm positive that they would not stop due to all the military funding and government contracts that are connected to their company, if they would take a break from the prototypes due to the 
structured in Hong Kong, then they would most likely start perfecting their consumer market. They clearly have contracts with many weapon companies, along with Oreo, My Little Pony, and Beats Electronics. So it's safe to say for the consumer markets that they would make products that would interchange. Maybe a fork that transforms into a spoon along with a knife. They would also work on their military contracts. For example, a bazooka that turns into a submachine gun, or a tank that can transform into a helicopter. Honestly, to Transformium technology, the possibilities are endless. As for Transformium, they would most likely run low again, but they could recover most of the KSI drones that were killed, along with the two Transformium grenades that lockdown detonated. So they would have enough Transformium for a time, and by the time the last night comes around, maybe KSI made a deal with the TRF to hand over any dead Transformers to them so they could continue to melt them down into Transformium. But to move on to Joyce himself, I'm sure he would stay CEO of KSI, since his dream to make the world a better place would still stick. He would feel bad about the destruction in Hong Kong caused by his prototypes, and since he's worth over $20 billion, which was stated in the film, he would pitch in to fix the damage that he caused, rebuilding and giving new homes to all that suffered in the attack. And at the end of Age of Extinction, Tessa says that their house got blown up, with Joyce saying I think I can help with that. I'm positive that the Jaeger family got a new home from Joyce, along with giving the necessary funds to put Tessa through college. And since Kate is an inventor like him, Joyce would probably give him a spot at the company, where Kate would probably work for a while until the TRF was formed, which made all Transformers illegal on Earth, besides in Cuba. And with Transformers now becoming illegal, Cade would quit his job at KSI and start doing rescue missions for Autobots who were getting tracked by the TRF. Knowing that Cade would need an anonymous place to hide, Joyce would get in contact with his old buddy Sherman, where Sherman would give Cade a junkyard that he could use as a base of operations, along with a sanctuary for the Autobot refugees. And to fully wrap Joyce's story up, during Age of Extinction, there was a romantic subplot between him and Sue Yeming that was left on a cliffhanger, so maybe the two tied to knot and expanded the KSI company around the globe to give poorer nations access to Transformium. Overall doing good for humanity. All in all, fulfilling Joyce's boyhood dream to truly make the world a better place. And with that, let's answer the final question on what happened to the rest of the KSI drones. As for Galvatron, he would eventually make his way to find his creators, which I'll be explaining in my What Happened to Galvatron video. As for the rest of the KSI crew, this is where it gets interesting. You see, once Galvatron set the KSI bots free from their programming, over time they began to create their own personalities with their new sense of free will, along with being able to transform like a regular transformer. Now the transformation part can be proven when we see the junk heaps transform. For a brief second, we can see parts on the garbage truck more or less move around and shapeshift before going full-blown Transformium. For example, look at the Mac logo at the front of the truck. Now why is this important, you may ask? Well, if you remember, Transformium is programmable metal, in case I programmed it to have a fancy block-like transformation. Now take that programming out, which was what Galvatron did, and a Transformium is eventually going to heal back to its original state. As we can see with the Junk Heap's cab, it started to partly transform, meaning that the Transformium is slowly reverting back to its mechanical transformation. And if you saw my video on the origins of Nitro Zeus, you know that the last KSI boss will become Nitro Zeus through this process. And as for all the other pro Prototypes, I think they would follow suit like Nitro did, with each of them following their own path and where they wanted to go. Most likely, most of them ended up in the TRF jails like Nitro did, since TRF has surveillance all over the world, managing all known Transformers activities. And as we saw in Transformers the last night, we saw the Junkie trio have an argument about something and fight in the streets. And how would they be able to fight if they still had KSI's programming? Concluding that all the surviving KSI prototypes became their own beings, and over time were able to transform like a regular Transformer. And just like that, that was the story of KSI. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you haven't already, check out the Fixing Transformers playlist for some more awesome theories. But before I go, I want to say a big fat thank you to all my Patreons and channel members for supporting the channel. It means a lot and I could not do it without you guys. So a big fat thank you to you. And as always, if you enjoyed this theory in the Fixing Transformers collection, please give a like ring because it helped the channel a lot. And as always, it's been Trans Theories reminding you guys to never stop theorizing.